Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. In today's episode, we hop over to the West Coast where we chat with Jimmy Kelly about the Wormblade. Still very relevant, still a great faction. Here's the conversation. How are you guys doing? doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm super excited. Got the uh, the WTC coming up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm super excited about WTC. Yeah, WTC so, is fun. coming up. You've had a really good competitive year, I think, as far as traveling around, having fun, making friends, and doing pretty well at some of these tournaments, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, mostly just amazing people. Like, I feel like as Kill Team is progressing, um, we're really just kind of, the cream is rising to the top as far as not even just sweatiness, or like, not the sweatiness, like the great people. like. Uh, <clears throat> The tournament you just TO'd uh, helped run and organize. I don't know how you you had so much on your shoulders. I don't know how you you did everything you did with that event. Um, but the people there were incredible. Um, and it's it's fun to show up and play and do well. But when you're hanging out and playing with people that are just just top quality and friendly and just make it a great experience, uh, it makes it awesome. So yeah. uh, the whole community, it just really feels like it's just really growing into just a friendly, like engaging, welcoming community. So yeah, I couldn't be happier with how it's going. Yeah. Good sportsmanship from everything I've seen too, which is amazing. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. real quick for the listeners that don't know, when is the WTC? Great question. Uh, t- August 10th and 11th, I think. I'm bad with numbers. It's the uh, second Saturday, Sunday of August. Uh, yeah, that's totally. Does someone, someone check my numbers? I don't even know if those. No, you're good. It's August uh, 10, good. 11 out in okay. uh, Michelin in Belgium, yeah. I think. It is. It's in Belgium. In between like Antwerp and uh, Brussels. Okay. All so. places that many of our American listeners, I'm sure, know exactly on a global map. Yeah. Americans are fantastic at international geographic information. We're, we're great. <clears throat> I can barely find Canada on the map. I'll be honest. So I, I, I was aware Belgium was in Europe and I had to find it and be like, Oh, there it is. That's, that's cool. But I'm going to feel very uh, cultured to be able to go to such a amazing place. So yeah. And that's, that's like, a, that's like a team tournament thing. Yeah. Yeah. So every, uh, countries are putting uh, five band teams together. So the U S we have one team. Um, one country, Spain is bringing three teams. I think two countries have multiple teams, if I remember correctly. France, uh, Poland, and Spain, I think, are all sending multiple teams. England has two. Oh, right. England's got two. So it's going to be a real killer's den, sending in five of America's finest into the wolf wolf den to uh, hopefully claim the big W. Oh, let's hope. I'm excited. I'm optimistic. At the very least, we're hoping that you guys come back with a good record because the WTC, unlike a lot of the events that we've been doing out in the U.S. and really over this last year, is a five team tournament compared to, you know, all Valley team tournament later this year is going to be three teams. Generally doubles has popped up. And I think, you know, 40K for being such a big game, from what I've heard, a lot of the the deeper gameplay mechanics show up when you can have a team cover your matchup weaknesses. So even though 40k is all about these crazy skew matchups, we're like, oh man, look at the stat checks of the knights. You know, in 40k and team settings, you can be like, well, that player, that they, they got a knight, we're going to go send in a team that's good against them, and we'll take a slightly less good matchup somewhere else, and it kind of covers up the skew that happens in 40k. So I'm sure, you know, you guys have been talking about it as Team America, trying to cover some deficiencies in building matchups, right, for the WTC? Yeah, I mean, we're trying. We're, we're figuring this all on the fly, because... Yeah, 40k five man team tournaments has been like the norm for them for a while. There's such such a big community, tons of players. 
uh, tilting is finally starting to grow to that place now where we can have five man teams and like have these events. But for us, this is the first time they're doing this. So all of our theory crafting is so theoretical. So we're just trying to figure things out and I'm sure we're going to go there, um, figure out where we were weak, uh, figure out what we can do better. Um, hopefully we do good while we're learning, but, uh, and then this last weekend, we actually did uh, a trial run. So I'm in San Diego. So we had all of Team USA come down to San Diego. And uh, I have a little workshop. So we all stayed together at my workshop. We uh, we got games, reps, practice. And the last day of the trip, we had a big community event. All the people from SoCal. We even had a guy from Arizona. Uh, we all came together and just had a big event. And we did a run through like it was WTC. So we had Team USA. And then every round we nominated a team captain to be a team challenger and he would recruit four players, put together a team that a strategy and we did the whole pairing just like we would over in Belgium. We will do over in Belgium and, uh, went through, did three runs and, uh, three rounds just to help get that flow. Cause you can do it on paper. You can try to figure things out, but at the end of the day, you really just kind of got to sit down and we totally made some mistakes as team USA. Uh, we figured out some pairing things we did wrong. Um, we gave count, we stuck Kellen on two bad matchups, two rounds in a row. So we made a mistake and we didn't even learn from it. We're like, let's just do that mistake again. <clears throat> but now we took a step back and we're, we're trying to learn. We're going to try to do better. So yeah. it was nice to be able to get that run through and it's a great community event. Tons of people showed up, super positive. Um, no one got blackout drunk. The only person at risk of that was probably me, to be honest. <laughs> so. I was good. I, I kept m- most of my clothes on. So that was, a, that was a positive, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Um, oh yeah. We all have like team USA jerseys. So if you beat one of the team USA players, you got their Jersey. And, uh, one of the, uh, your teammate, Adrian, mm-hmm. uh, he was out there with us cause you know, he's the best and he, he lost a match. Um, a mirror match against one of our local players. And we, I've always said San Diego has got some like SoCal has got some great talent. So this guy showed up, Rob, he's on, uh, the squad games podcast now. And then great player doesn't travel. So if you don't, if you're not in SoCal, you don't see this guy or don't play against him. And he beat Adrian in the mirror match, I think by a single point <clears throat> and Man? Couldn't, couldn't be more excited. So people were wearing their team USA jerseys. If they, if they happen to be the player, it was a lot of fun. And, like those kinds of experiences are so great because Adrian, you don't like when you beat him, it's like an inoculation. It's like a vaccine. You beat him once and he's like, I'm going to lock that in. That's never going to happen again. So <laughs> you can, you can only do it once against him. And he's like, that's it. We're done now. So it's good to be able to like get those in now and see, like he got to see uh Mandrake turn with a totally different strategy. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, a way that he definitely- didn't. Definitely a big part of just playing the game in general, because a lot of people talk about stats from this very kind of sterile view of Kill Team. But because Kill Team has so much more back and forth, the stats only give you a little bit of information. It's really about play styles and important pivot points. Like at a fork in a road, are you going to choose to kill a chooser of the flesh or are you going to choose to let it kind of run amok in the background? Right. And when you're right, playing absolutely. against this thing. The difference between those two games where a chooser can get a kill or two for the Mandrakes and a game where the chooser gets nothing, those games, from what I can tell from the small amount of times that I've played against them, that's going to be a really big pivot point for how you play against Mandrakes. If you can kill a chooser before it gets one APL to give out to someone else, the game kind of pivots because now instead of playing the scary dark elf team with four up invulns, now you're just playing, you know, hand of the Archon with no pain points, which is not great. Yeah. Oh, no, it's huge. And I was talking to Baki about this, um, about like how to train someone to go from like a good player to like a great player, like the, the top level. And we were, we we're talking a lot about like, what are these things? Like, what are the things you plug in? And it's so fluid and it's so changing in the moment. Um, you have to play it out. Like that example you just gave the answer. It could be like the chooser it could be the dirge mall. And it depends on the board state. It depends on the turnaround. It depends on what's going to cost you to get one of these models. And it's this really complicated tree of decisions. And the only way to really solve it, you can't go to the discords. You can't go to a group that you've got to get on there, play the games, see what works. And the, I've always found the best way to learn is you get your ass beat. You jump in there, someone does it against you and you're like, Oh, wow, that completely shut down my game. 
I really needed that thing. I thought it'd be okay to sacrifice that model and I needed it. But um, it's, it's complicated. If this was an easy game, this wouldn't be as fun to travel and play new people and, you know, jump into different metas. So it's very, very complicated. But yeah, getting on the table and playing it out, absolutely crucial. And like, don't just throw in the towel when things are looking rough because there's so many times for like crazy comebacks and crazy opportunities. And just like when you take a big hit, don't let it get to your head. Just like keep on doing the best thing you can. And like, you know, like oh, yeah. your opponent might just have a horrible yeah. dice roll or might just like get like feel like they have such a lead that they do something sloppy and you can really capitalize on it and come back. Um, like there were some stories and we've kind of like mentioned them before. And like, um, like, like Adrian had a, a game or two where he, was like one four on the primary and like came back and uh, pulled a tire or a win <laughs> yeah no uh he was like against baki the last two games of uh tacoma uh the second to last was baki and yeah baki was using that patriarch and just stomping getting primaries getting secondaries and he came back clawed it out and they actually finished the game and they thought baki won and then they realized they had misplayed the very last action redid it and then went down and like oh it's actually a tie and it was just incredible Craziness. because like if you watched it the game was over everyone watching that game middle of round three was like it's over adrian's cooked <clears throat> i had been spending like a half hour planning on what to do to uh baki because i was sure i was gonna play him and he crawled it back and then my last game with uh adrian i held him four one on primaries two rounds in a row but the dude just he blocked my secondaries and he clawed back and he was able to get those uh, gems to get three APL and he snowballed it. And it was down to the last activation, last guy beat it by a single point. It was incredible. Such a fun game. And yeah, like you hang in there, you clawed out. Um, I had a little experience of mine the other way at this last event this last weekend. But there are some times you're just like, oh, it's over. That's it. And there's... You just fight back for those angles. You find your position, but you're always, uh, always in that game. Yeah. Keeping that positive yeah, if attitude. If you don't give up and you know that the game is a dice game, you can always at least look for a line. You might not have a lot of good lines, but you can find a line that might get you out. I think Adrian's had a couple stories at the World Championships last year. There was the commando mirror where his opponent triple sneaky get it and there was nowhere for him to go. And the only play left was to chuck a bomb squig through three door through a door and a half and like nuke three commandos. And if that's the only line you have, that's the one you got to take. Did you have any moments like that actually at this tournament in San Diego this weekend where you were stuck in a pickle and you were able to find some obscure line? Because, you know, Wormblade are a team that have been doing pretty well this year. And it's the team that we're planning to talk about this podcast. And, you know, you switched over to them somewhat recently. You know, earlier this year you were on Felgor. I think you were doing something else before Wormblade. But now you're on Wormblade, it sounds like. For the yeah. Future. As long as I have to. Um I, I'm kind of infamous where I never stick to a team. I don't think I've taken any team to a tournament more than two or three times. I think three is the max. I've been up with like one team. Um, I like to switch around. So earlier this year, uh, Nemesis Claw came out. My son was playing him. I played against him. I'm like, this team is fun. Um, and then he went uh, on a school trip to Panama uh, for BAC. And I wasn't sure what team I was going to take. So I asked him, I was like, hey, Jesh, can I just take your Nemesis Claw? So took his Nemesis Claw. Um, one of the most fun teams to play. Love Nemesis Claw. Um, so did BAC with them. Then did Midsummer, And I was like, you know what else is fun? These Mandrakes. So I brought Mandrakes to Midsummer, And I was wanting to bring either one of those teams to WTC. But <clears throat> Adrian uh, wanted to run Mandrake. So like, give the man his, uh, his elves. Let's do it. And they're painted beautifully. It's great. Um, and I don't like Nemesis. I love Nemesis before the last balance date. Data slate. But... I don't like Nemesis now. And it's a team that can be crushed. If a couple things go wrong early, you can get steamrolled. And on this format, that the whole team could lose. If you get tabled or dumpstered, your one loss could bring down the entire team. So I was like, okay, I'm not doing Nemesis. I'm not doing Mandrakes. And we kind of figured for the team, Wormblade would be a, a strong one. And you can pick your mission. So like Wormblade on loot. Seems strong for the team. So I brought it to Tacoma just to help practice for WTC. 
So I'm doing it for America. Yeah, Worm, Wormblade has been showing some hot statistics. Um, like they're they're looking like a really strong choice. I mean, like it's it's easy to just nosedive and train wreck that team, but it looks like it has a really high capacity for playing it really well. Um, so mm -hmm. definitely excited to see how you do out there. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm excited for it. And then yeah, so your question about the uh, the finding uh, a boost. line. Yeah. Oh. So I had one of the had the worst moments. I guess one of the best players, a uh, local Alexander Popov, um, yeah. super cool guy. Um, and he's always uh, he's always giving me a little bit of shit on the the discords. So if you see a uh, an Alex out there talking mad shit about some jellyfish, it's that that's the one. That's the guy. Um, so anyways, we're playing, having a friendly match. Turn one, I run into the dark, and he's playing Inquisition. And I pop meticulous plan for the free mission actions. And I ask him if he wants to deny it. And I hear, yeah. So I'm like, okay. And I confirmed too. I was like, so I can't do it? No. All right. So I, I roll the, the little die for a CP. He goes down one. I roll mine back up one. And then I play round one, setting up because like meticulous plan is the cru one of the crucial weapons for Wormblade. Like it's essential on loot, on into the dark. It's not optional, right? Like yeah. it's the back. It's the background of the team. It's like, and, and for uh, listeners who don't know what this is, because people have never seen Wormblade before, somehow yeah. at this point, it's the meticulous plan. Is all of your neophytes, I believe, can do a mission action for free. Yeah, so which it is innocuous, makes... innocuous yeah. enough. But on in the dark, when you can do your hiding variant and open two doors for free, suddenly means that you can be basically anywhere. Yeah, it, it's so strong. They're ba all basically APL three. Between looting and door opening, everyone on your team is going to do something. It's so efficient, but you have to use it earlier in the game. By the end, you're not going to be able to just run into a point and loot it because there's a body there. The doors are mostly open. It's the later in the game you use it, the more efficiency you lose. You got to use it turn one or turn two. Um, <clears throat> so he denied it, um, turn one. And, uh, I set up. Now I'm saying that my entire strategy is to set up to have it turn two and turn two starts. I pay a meticulous plan and he says, I'm going to uh, stop it. You know, I don't even know the, I don't know the names of the toys, but he's like, the, the no, not doing it. And I was like, here's the thing, Alex, I guess you don't know your rules. You big moron. Uh, you can't do it twice. And he's like, I didn't do it twice. I was like, Alex, you stopped at the first turn. He said, no, I said, no, you can do it. I was like, Oh my God. No, I didn't. <laughs> Like it was a complete genuine misunderstanding, but he didn't deny it. I just denied myself. I just blocked myself at a turn one. He stopped at turn two. So I was able to use a turn three, but like the efficiency was almost nothing. And that happened. He got the initiative turn two, got a big double kill. So when I had my first activation turn two, I was down six models, half my team. I'd only taken two inquisition agents out. And then I had to start turn two from losing the thing I was depending on. And I was able to come back. I got a few uh, key plays and a few key double kills. But ugh, it was it was rough. Um, it was rough. So <laughs> yeah, luckily, uh, but those happen. Yeah. luckily for you, Wormblade is one of those teams with a handful of tools to be able to climb out of these big operative holes, you know. Teams that have three APL operatives who can actually do stuff. So Brood Brothers, Wormblade, Space Marines in general. If you can get the operative count back to a little bit more at parity, these three APL operatives can really do a lot of work, right? So Wormblade yeah. are blessed with four different choices. Which one of your heroes had to do some heavy lifting in this four operative deficit? Oh, uh, so I had the Locust and the Kelomorph, and the Locust was already dead. Ooh. So gone. Ooh. Um, that's a that's a yeah. spooky game. Keller Morph is yep, a pistol guy. Was, um, they they call Morph a pistol guy. So he's like the the gunslinger. He's got three pistols. He double shoots, and uh, he has a, a melee option: three dice on threes, damage three four. So he can like smack you with a pistol. Um, it's it's not like you don't use it for melee, but I had to. So he was outside of a room trying to keep him safe. And I used that guy to charge someone that was locked up in melee with one of my current guys. He charged and fought, and I was able to get a crit, and I parried him out and lived. Um, just like my basic neophyte dude. So the guy was on four wounds. So the Keller Morse profile is three, four. So I was like, the guy I needed to kill, he had the pistolier, 
uh, inquisition of the pistolier higher up in the room. And that pistolier is just going to start deleting two models a turn. And so I had to get these two models out and then use other models to start swinging back. So I charged in the combat, <clears throat> uh, paid for Coiled Serpent. So to guarantee a crit. So it's tough to have to use that, but I was like, I'm going to roll three dice. What are the odds of getting a six? He's not lethal five. So I paid Coiled Serpent. Uh, I rolled a six natively anyways, because of course I did, right? As soon as you pay for it, it's like, yeah, there's your six. You don't need it. So I killed the guy in melee, and then I shot the Pistolier. Um, and I I didn't roll great. I got um, He has the shooting for the Keller Morph is five dice, hitting on twos, um, piercing one, rending. So damage three, four. So it deletes like elites. It's so strong. And uh, the first time you flip to engage... All of Wormblade have uh, Colt Ambush, so they reroll all of one number. So now, generally in, in Kill Team, whenever you have a reroll all of one number, most people call it Wormblade rerolls. Um, mm-hmm. At least I do. So um, when you hit on twos, rerolling all of one number, that's your ones. So you basically have Relentless. Um, five dice hitting on twos, three, four, piercing, rending, like, so strong. But here's the thing. It's your first fighter shoot. So I had to use my fight in melee so I don't get rerolls on the shoot, and I can't use Coiled Serpent to guarantee the crit. Because you guarantee a crit with his shooting, you automatically trigger piercing, and you automatically trigger rending. So if you roll nothing, you're guaranteeing two crits and AP1. It's so strong. I can't do it. I have to just hope I roll good. And I rolled two ones. So I I, I hit, and uh, I got three hits and two ones. So that's that's not enough. That, he rolls three dice, he gets one five, he's good to go. So I had to pay for a CP re-roll. I got just another regular hit. No, like, so he's going to have three dice, and I hope for the best. He uh, missed the save. So I got those two models. It was like every action was just fighting back to, like, regain this. I had to completely abandon the middle corridor. He had run his axe jack down, like, just in the middle of the hallway, just, like, charged him down, gave it three APL. And I see it coming to my back objective where I have a neophyte gunner holding my back point. And I just know he can make the charge, he can loot, and he can kill this guy. And I'm giving up that entire corridor. <clears throat> but I had to I had to abandon it. Folks on the other side. Um, Alex played really strong. It was a, a very bloody game. But it was a fun one. It was a fun one. I was able to just barely uh, scratch it out. Yeah, it's a good way to think about how you need to climb back from a big deficit, right? Losing four models on the between the first two turns of the game means that you're going to have to take the riskier lines because you need to find higher value plays than just trading off one dude for one dude. Because you do that when you're down two models ostensibly because it, I think it's a 12... Eh, no, 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 they're both 12, 12 model teams, right? So you've, you're down at a big deficit. Hmm? So Inquisition has, the, Inquisition has 13 because of the book. I got that. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, so it's technically 13, but it's realistically 12. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, yeah. Good job on yeah. clawing that back from the jaws of defeat. Yeah, that was a, it was a fun one. But you know, it, those games are so much fun though. And when, you, when, you, when you're coming back, whether you pull it off or not, sometimes you just claw back and you thought you were going to get tabled turn two, and you come back and lose by a point, and that feels great. You're like, man, hey, I was in there. Like, that was cool. Um, But yeah, they're fun games. I'm always telling players that if they want to become better kill team players or better game players, instead of evaluating things on whether or not you win or lose, you need to evaluate things on whether or not they were the right decision. Right? Because at the end of the day, we're playing a dice game. If you roll dice and, you know, your Wormblade, Pistolier, five attacks on twos, three, four, P1, rending, you miss twice, you're like, oh, I definitely probably, like, you know, on most cases, you're going to kill a five up save model with seven wounds, but you're not guaranteed to. So if you don't spend that die, you are probably not guaranteed to do anything. So chucking the die there definitely mattered. To be fair, you know, Alex, it sounds like there was plenty of chances for him to, on those three dice or four dice with a CP reroll, save out that model. But he didn't do it. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think it was just pure whiffs. I forget the, the details. And I think that Pistolier had taken two damage previously. Mm, I so he was on five. So I needed to push two dice. Um, so when I got four, that definitely helped. So I, I remember when he, when he rolled his defense knife, it wasn't, it wasn't worth uh, re-rolling. 
So I think I think he got it was all misses. So you'd have to like you'd have to make all three to like save yeah. it once you get to four. Yeah, makes so sense. <clears throat> makes yeah. sense. Versus so when I made the in first the time that we've Sorry, been playing Wormblade, you know, compared to Nemesis Claw or Felgor, have you found one of the agents stands out? I know you mentioned in this last game on In the Dark, you played the Locust and War and the Keller Morph. I think that the general consensus that everyone always has is that everyone always takes a Kelomorph. Do you, are you there? Is that where, is that where the, uh, the worm blade Jimmy is at? I love Locust. The Locust is my favorite. Um, he doesn't make you friends though. No one likes the Locust. Um, so his special thing, um, he charges in, he has almost the same kind of profile in melee, five dice hitting on twos, lethal five though. And, uh, damage four, six. Um, crazy powerful, and he gets to parry before the attacker. And so if he's the attacker, he parries, and then he starts going again. So if you charge someone, and they get only two successes, you just parry both out, and go nuts. Um, and then after he fights, he gets to do a three-inch charge. Every time. If you charge him and fight, he can charge someone else immediately. And very few people charge and fight him, because he's a monster. Um, but you can, if you're playing horde teams, you can charge in, fight, kill, charge down, fight, kill, and charge and stick in the melee and do a third person who just does not want to be in melee with them. So I love, I, I like melee in general. I think, um, the locust is just an oppressive model that's so hard to play around is that three inch charge. You can really reach different, like you have to really space out. So horde teams is just impossible, tends to be. And uh he's just such a difficult model to deal with. Um so I love him a lot. The Kelomorph everyone loves. Um he can be a little bit difficult to play correctly, and oftentimes you're just hoping to get two models out. You want to be able to set up end of train point two. I like I like to set him up kind of in reserve, train point one. So you can be a counter punch, someone that comes up, you can move out and double shoot. And then you hope you get the initiative so he can move out and kill one or two more models. And then he probably dies. Um, but he's great. And he also has a, the, oh, the killer morph also has an indirect option for one absent point. He has hypersense. So you can replace piercing and rending with no cover and indirect. And that's also vicious. So you just roll up. You don't get all the guaranteed crits, but just for a weight of dice on a like one of the strongest grenades in the game right <clears throat> five on twos damage three four with no cover it's it's powerful maybe um you know the elites might live but it kills most things in the game um but it costs one action point to do that um i see why he's so popular but some of the other ones are really fantastic too all of them can't be slept on they're all great options so the sniper can be fantastic depending on the board setup. So their sniper is, is great. Three APL. All of them are nine wounds with four pin bone saves. And all of them have a special thing like rust offers. They can retain two dice um, when they're in cover. Or it also lets them retain one crit save. So really cool. <clears throat> so they're pretty durable if you try to shoot at them. So their sniper is four dice on twos. Um, mortal wound, like three, three damage, mortal wounds three. But he has two special actions he gets to do. One, he can take away obscuring and no, and add no cover to a shot. So, fantastic. You know, we got Mandrakes with Smoke. You got uh, uh, Nemesis Claw with their obscuring. Tons of teams are using obscuring now to stay safe. Takes it away. And then for one, he gives himself lethal five. So, if you can get him in a sniper nest... He goes, gives himself lethal five, takes away your cover saves, takes away obscuring, and just takes a shot. Anyone on the board, if you're engaged, he just deletes the model. Um, so if you can get him into a sniper nest reasonably, um, fantastic way to stay safe and just delete things anywhere on the board. Yeah, he's a model that you need to be able to find a position to, for him to do something on turn one. 
or else he is kind of giving up some value because he's only going to get one shot off a turn, right? A lot of these other models get two fights. The Kelomorph and the Locust both get to take two aggressive actions. So when you pick the Sniper on Wormblade, you are telling your opponent that this guy is going to either shoot three times or four times. And each one of those times, it has to matter. Because yeah. otherwise, you're giving up a mobile piece that can really swing the course of a game. So probably better against teams that you activate out on some level or teams that just have a lot of obscurity where you aren't expecting a lot of play, right? Right, absolutely. Um, it really, it, it so depends on the map and who you're going against. Um, I keep wanting to try to find a way to, to justify taking him under the dark and haven't done it so far. Um, but I believe... Maybe one day I can find uh, a board that makes sense for an opponent. I don't know. But um, he's the hardest to, to justify taking because on good maps, it's hard to get him to take a shot from one, like you said. you got to be able to dash him up onto a vantage where he's in cover, or you've got to start him on a, a vantage and then drop a barricade for cover. Like In a lot of maps, you can't dash and put the barricade, and you can't just lose a turn. It's, uh, there's too much going on. You can't just take away that, you know, you have some threats with other agents. So if you just take away all that threat from that, it's too much. You got to strike hard and fast with one blade because they're complete glass cannons. They're so powerful that you don't get those points, but they've got to strike early. The whole strength of that team is early threats. Good. Yeah. What's, so that, that, what's that, that fourth that, operative? I'm assuming that's what I you're was, heading yeah, yeah, into. Yeah. Yep. The talent. So, yeah, so there's the Sanctus uh, Sniper, and then there's the Sanctus Talon. So, um, yeah, the Talon was never used at all, and then in one of the recent um, data slates, it got a buff, and it definitely makes this model a monster. So it's uh, nine wounds, all the same base stats, right? Um, it has a melee, it's a melee option, and I don't believe it has any shooting. So the Zero guns. Has yeah, zero guns. The the locust actually has a silent tail whip that no one uses. They all forget about it. Uh, but it has a silent little shooting attack. Three in turn. But the the talon, no shooting, all melee. Four dice, not five, like the locust. Uh, four dice hitting on twos. Um, lethal four. So that's cool. Damage three six. Um, with stun. Yeah, with with. Does it have stun? It has stun. Um, there you go. Uh, I, I to learn too. that it there oftentimes go. doesn't matter because when you have three six lethal four and you hit your opponent, well, generally they just die. <laughs> it's there's is more to it than that. You never use the stun. You because of the new ability they get, it's just literally never a factor now uh, for when you take it. So it has this new thing called um, soul sight. So you pick a model for an action point, any model, any model at all. When they fight, the first time it strikes with a crit, it can push through a normal success as well. And if it doesn't have any normals, if it only has crits, it gets to push through two crits. Um, so one strike is a minimum nine damage, and it gains balanced uh, for the attack. So just in case you somehow didn't, you know, you have four hidden on twos, I don't know, did you roll three ones? Reroll one of them, that's all you need, you're fine. Or if you rolled, uh, you know, four dice and they're all twos and threes, re-roll one, you're fine now. To get a four up, it's like, I've never seen it not do its thing. Um, and it gets to charge from conceal. So, um, pushing through nine, once you go against a lot of Eldar teams, um, a lot of, uh, eight wound teams, seven or eight wound teams, it just auto deletes them. It's pretty fantastic. Um, and then when it's done with melee, if it's not in, uh, no, no, even if it is, even if it's still an engagement, it gets to do a dash. So it's a really fun model to go up, kill, and then dash over to take a point. Uh, so especially on capture, it's a real fun one. Go up, get a kill, take no punch back, and then dash over, land on a point, and I got three APL on, on an objective. Um, or dash back to get safe. You know, maybe they're out in the open, you kill, and then you dash over, tuck behind heavy cover, good to go but it gives you extra mobility and the ability to push through damage with no punchback at all is amazing 
Yeah. So <laughs> one of the big issues I think that I've seen Locus users you have over the last couple of years of competitive play is while it, it it does double parry and it is kind of scary, it only has nine wounds. So any damage that lands on the Locus is going to affect its next activation or your opponent's response to that activation. Whereas the Sanctus Talon is a melee operative that just just kills things outright. If you can manage to just land only crits, you know, the familiar soul sight, the thing that you've been talking about, does have a rider that says if you have no normal hits, you can strike with a crit and then another crit, which means it's 12 damage. So if you can line it up and your opponent just loses a 12 wound model and then you dash back out of conceal, you've taken no damage. Now, if your opponent charges you, you they are not killing you in one round of fighting, right? I think one of the big issues with the Locust is against teams like the Felgor, if they hit you for four, or Commandos, I suppose, because these are both four or five damage breakpoint teams. Yeah. If they hit you once in melee, then the next guy can come in, and if they land a crit, you just die. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the Locust is so strong, but he can only take out, in any matchup, it's hard to take out more than two or three models. Uh, because nine wounds, they stack up. Um, and if you ever get more than three successes, they're going to punch back before you kill. Because there's no six wound operatives in the game. So it always takes two strikes to kill. So if you get three successes, you're taking damage back. Um, but they have that locus. You can't use I mean, the Talon. You're not going to use it against uh, probably the 10-wound teams um, just because... You don't want the risk. Because. Exactly. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Eldar and below, up to eight, you know, or the leader would have nine or whatever. Fantastic model. Um, and oh, the fun thing, oh, another fun way to use a uh, familiar soul site is if you do set things up where there's one model that can get you, you can use the soul site on the model that's able to charge. So on its charge, it fights, it can land one blow and then you end it. So yeah, the talent allows you to proactively go after someone and then you can use soul site afterwards and point it at the next guy in range and say, come and get me. And then because it says for the, yeah. until the end of the turning point, you now have brutal and balance against that exact target and you can double strike as long as you get a crit. Suddenly now you can have a talent that proactively goes to snipe one dude. And sure, you might take a little bit of damage on the way out of that single model. But afterwards, you're now in a safer position. And if your opponent charges you, that's fine with you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, very fun. And they're, hard, they're hard to shoot. So they have like the, the invuln saves and uh, double retains or the crit retains. So oftentimes there are models you want to try to remove in melee, and it's just a really fun thing to uh, shut some of that down. So yeah, the operatives are very cool. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point actually in the conversations we've had so far. You when you were talking about setting up the WTC, you mentioned that Wormblade because they're good on loot. That's one useful thing about the team. But now when you talked about the Sanctus Talon, you mentioned that it's really good on capture. Are there any other operative convert like agent? switch ups that you make depending on the mission because we've got three different kinds of missions and I think operative selection Wormblade are lucky that they're one of the few teams that actually gets to make some operative choices so do you actually make different decisions based on the mission type? Great question. I think the operatives is almost solely based on um, the map and the opposing player faction um, the nice thing is all these models are so flexible. They have so many different ways they can be used. You can play them different based on the different mission. Um, and even like, for example, like moving up to a, hit a point. Um, I use the Talon on a capture mission, uh, the, the game against Adrian. And that, that model was how I was able to go for one, the first two points. So another, um, another model, the icon grabbed one of his four points in turn one. That model died, and then I killed the model that killed it, and then dashed onto it with the Talon to retake it again, turning point two. But it can also be great to deny loot, because you stick a 3 APL model onto an objective that hasn't been looted yet, and now that other person can't, you know, just run up and grab it. Even an icon can't, or, you know, they can't even grab it. So, it, you have different, like, I think the way I use the models can change based on the mission. But I feel like the mission, the map, the layout is the key driver in what you take. So, but that, that's one of those things too. I don't have like a decision tree where it's like, this is exactly when I take this or that. Um, I have a general idea. 
the go-to standards are locusts and killer morphs. But if you get a good open map <clears throat> and you see a so- spot for that sniper, there's almost no time that sniper is not good if the board is right for it. Um, every opponent, you, you have a model that should be doing four to one trades. And, or if you're elites, maybe it doesn't kill an elite. But that's going to take out two elites for sure. And this would take out a third of their team, that one model. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's, I think it's most heavily dependent upon boards and players. Yeah. But I also, I also like, you know, sometimes they have to get squirrely and you see a certain thing. It's like, Hey, you know what? You don't even know why. You're just like, we're taking the town this time. I, mean, I don't know. It's, uh, the, like I said, talents are great in Eldar. So you play Eldar, that's a, a really good one to bring the talent into. But a lot of it's by feel. So yeah, no, I think having things by feel is a perfectly valid way to kind of approach things. I for as much as the dice matter and stats matter, at the end of the day, comfort is also a big thing. If you know how to use a piece into a specific matchup and you haven't been challenged on it, as long as you're able to clear eyed go back over your game afterwards and judge whether or not it was the right choice until you're tested, you know, sometimes you don't know. So right now you might be that it's really good into elite or into Eldar. Maybe that'll change. I suspect not because nine damage hitting any specific Eldar when you out activate them is probably good enough to just be a, f- a good baseline point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, We've yeah. got a couple other interesting choices that happen on the Wormblade team as far as operative selections and loadouts. You know, the leader has a couple choices and the heavy gunners, you've got a couple choices. And even the gunner, technically you have a choice. But I suspect that many people don't care too much past the grenade launcher on the gunner. But the heavy gunners, there are three actual choices and they all maybe have their choices. Do you have strong preferences between the heavy stubber, the mining laser, and the seismic cannon? Okay, so... 90 some percent of the time it's mining laser seismic cannon just those two there's only a few times i sub out one for the heavy stubber and it's kind of when you're going against an almost pure seven moon five up save team um veteran guard stand out is probably the big one right veteran guard right yeah veteran guard um Jeez. Uh, Pathfinders also, you know, outside of the recon drone, they're all seven wound five yep. up saves. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for doing my thing. Yeah, I, I would like, I don't know why I was struggling. Yeah, those two are the best examples. Um, yeah, if you have <clears throat> weak saves, low wounds, you need to land just dice. You don't need, so okay, let's, let's talk about what the profiles are, I guess. Um, we'll start some basics. You take one of three heavy gunners, they have bigger bases. All the wounds, all the stats are the same. Seven wounds, five up save, six inch move. Um, all the heavy gunners now come with cumbersome, so they're not really heavy. They can all move six inches. Huge, huge buff they got. So <clears throat> the mining laser is a monster. It's uh, five dice on fours, AP one, damage five, six. So not piercing, just AP one right away, uh, five, six damage, monster. Um, five dice, all of them hit on fours. All hit on force. So this has punch. This is what you hit the stronger guys with. This is great into scouts. This is great into commandos, you know, tougher models, rest stalkers. This is the thing you hit them with, right? And uh, the first time you shoot them, when you flip from conceal and engage, you reroll all of one number. So it's on fours, but you're probably going to reroll two dice. So it's kind of like rolling seven dice. Um, you know, statistically, you're going to be rolling like two. If you roll really bad, you'll re-roll more. But you roll a lot of dice to get four ups, and it's pretty reliable at deleting the model. <clears throat> the model, the if you that's the one you would most likely drop if you go to the heavy stubber. The heavy stubber is five dice on fours, damage three four, but it has built-in ceaseless. So the built-in ceaseless is fantastic. It's also good on into the dark because if you go on guard, now you're looking on fives. So and you don't get Wormblade rerolls on Guard or Overwatch. So just more passive rerolls, the better. You want every chance you can to get those successes in. So it coming with Ceaseless, so your first shot, if you're on fours, rerolling ones, you just want to avoid twos and threes. And if you get twos or threes, you reroll those. So there's pretty much, you'll just miss on one number. You have five dice and only one number at most to miss. And then you reroll the rest 
really good way to just roll a ton of dice and make sure you just get successes. If you just need, you know, a crit and a hit to kill a Pathfinder or a Backlog. I mean, importantly, the big thing here is a distinction that you get a lot of dice and you don't care about what the results are specifically, right? The natural rerolls help a lot, even though you're hitting on fours, because you have the layer of Wormblade rerolls and your Ceaseless, which is great. And it's at any range. So when you are getting into a shootout, you can just get into a shootout. Yeah, Versus something absolutely. like the Seismic Cannon, where you have two separate profiles, one that's Blast 1, that's long range, but only 2-2 two, two damage. So it's not really reliably killing anything, but it's got stun, which is great in shooting attacks. And then one that got a big buff because of the suspensor systems and this cumbersome rule. So now you effectively have a big shotgun. Four dice on threes, four, four, range six, P1. It's a pretty good shotgun with stun. It's, it's brutal. It's, uh, and hitting on threes with those rerolls is so strong and piercing. So you can also... Hey, Coiled Serpent. Uh, let's talk about Coiled Serpent real quick, because this is important. We mentioned it earlier. So Coiled Serpent, when a model flips from Conceal to Engage, um, you pay a CP. Uh, sometimes there's an exception to that. We'll get to it. Um, you pay a CP to use a ploy, and you can retain one of your normals as a crit. So you just make it a crit. So uh, they have a lot of piercing. They have a lot of stun. And you can just guarantee it. So... Um, like that blast one on the long range is actually so good. So many people don't even bother thinking about blast one. And if you bunch your models, um, it can hit multiple and stun all of them. So huge thing for turning point two or three. Sometimes people on deployment will set up, but then as you're moving into turning point two, they like two people or three people charge one area. That guy dies. And now you have these two or three guys just right next to each other. Hit him with uh, the blast one pop. You don't. You have six dice. The long range is six dice and on fours. So maybe you don't need to use coiled serpent because he has such a high chance already with re rolls on each one. And that that one blade re roll when you have blast or torrent, you get the re rolls for all of them. It's considered like one shot. So if you pay coiled serpent or the one blade re rolls, every single one of those blast shots gets all those benefits. So strong. But yeah, so the, the close one, you can use Coiled Serpent and guarantee, turns it from Piercing 1 to AP 1. Um, harder to save. And man, that is just a brutal... Uh, another one fantastic against uh, Scouts. Because 4-4 four, four, Piercing 1, ooh, that's a dead Scout. So, yeah. So generally, the mining laser, generally the seismic cannon. Every once in a while, when you need to just chuck dice down range, we'll switch out, I assume, the seismic cannon for the heavy stubber, just so that you have two fully long-range threats so you can just get into a shootout, and then yeah. slink back into cover. I think I sub the uh, mining laser. Oh, interesting. Because yeah, if you're taking the heavy stubber, you just don't need the damage output of the mining laser. But I still love the variable threat, because the long-range... Six dice on twos, that that really does actually. You can you can stack a bunch of uh, successes because it's six dice with all those re rolls. So you're going to be throwing like nine or ten dice, and you have stun. And one of the best things sometimes sometimes letting the model live on one or two wounds can almost be better for you than killing. Um, it really just hampers the whole team down. Um, and then it's an easy kill. So a launch point for another model to charge in take into combat with someone that's on two wounds or one wound left. Um, it all depends. But like the size mechanic with the stun and uh, really powerful kind of short range, I, I think I pretty much just always keep that. Um, but if I'm taking the seismic, if I'm taking the heavy stubber, it's just because I just don't need piercing one five, six damage. Yeah. And like, especially with the, with leaving someone on one or two, does that synergize at all with the tack ops you play or like, what do you play for tack ops? Is that something that great you question. switch up a lot or do you kind of have like a fixed thing that generally works all the time? A great question. So I got one game with Wormblade, their current, uh, balanced data slate before Tacoma and tack ops was my weakest part of my game. Uh, tack ops is what lost me the game to Adrian. Um, so I'm I'm learning still. I'm trying to figure out. It's you either take uh, infiltrate or seek and destroy. Um, horde teams you take seek and destroy. 
um, elites or really tough teams, it's better to take uh, infiltrate. And I'm, I'm I'm trying to get games in to see what I like. Um, still trying to play it out. This last weekend, I got a little bit, a little bit better reps. Um, the guy who gave me some tips, uh, Jason Steinke, uh, won SoCal Open last year. Um, he loves infiltrate, um, except on just hordes. Like you know, you're going against a bunch of seven model teams. Um, I prefer seek and destroy. If in doubt, I'm leaning more towards seek and destroy because just move up and kill stuff. Um, I like it. But if you go infiltrate, uh, implant is a key one. The the locust works fantastic for implant because so often he is able to parry out the few successes and then for free implant and kill. And like he can score you all two points of implant by himself sometimes. Um, so that's good. Seize defenses is a good one. People try to like movement block you uh, when you're one blade. It's a good way to use your barricades. Get some forward defenses. Stop your charging like the locusts, or stop a Kellermore from hitting a small gap. So these defenses can be good. Um, I don't know all the names. What are the, what's the one where you control a point in your opponent's deployment? Subversive on control. Boom. I like that one a lot. Um, but you have to know you're going to be in it in the late game. There are certain teams like Brood Brothers. I'll try to get a try to get early loots or early points, you know, secures, whatever. And then I'm, I try to take a lead on primaries. And then I try to control the demolition of my team because my team will collapse and die mercilessly. So I'm just trying to, it's like a controlled uh, descent. Like as I'm being killed, I'm just trying to mitigate it. It's hard to get downfield. Um, but if you feel like there's a team you can steamroll and get downfield, it's a fantastic, uh, secondary. Um, and then there's Gather Surveillance, which even with hiding is really hard to score turn one. Um, Gather Surveillance was just S tier with uh, Commandos. Um, so that brought out there, get that point turn one. It's so much harder to score two and three because you have to declare it ahead of time to give them an easy target. Um, so it can be a tough one that at top tables people can play around a lot. But <clears throat> so a guy that plays it really well, really likes infiltration. Um, Implant and gather uh, and seize defenses are definitely two of his favorites. Um, a little mix up on like you know a little bit of uh, on the opponent and the board whether you go um, capture surveillance was that was that the name? Yeah, there's or I think it's gather surveillance. Gather, gather surveillance and then there's the Jason. You just mentioned a second ago. Subversive That's control. How bad my is. Yeah, Subver- subversive yeah. control is a yes. big one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that one. But you can only score it on turns three and four, and it's only on your opponent's, opponent's. side or half, yeah. I think. Yep, see you know your opponent's side. You know, I would have kind of thought that um, stock target would be one of the go-to ones, especially against elites, because you just super-duper outnumber them, and then you choose one of the elites that you know is going to push forward, and then you just park someone outside of three inches to do something else. Um, even if it's just, like, contest the same objective, stay out of combat, uh, that scores you a point, do it again later. Boom. Yeah. Um, here's what's tough. So I, I think you can get one point that easy. And you know what? With some teams, if you know it's gonna be close, you just take that secondary, you just like as long as I can get at least one and I'll try for the second, that can be good. What's really tough is taking an object um attack op which makes you leave models on the table. Like as much as like but that would pair very well with leaving a model alive on one or two. Um but here's the thing. You can never plan to leave a model alive on one or two. If you take um, stock target, <clears throat> it's hard to shoot that model. It's really hard because like I want to do damage, but just not like that's the, it's dice and it's so hard to plan for it. Like I'm okay if you take a shot with a two, two weapon, like you, you move up, you flame or someone, you don't always expect me to die, but you just want to put that like, let's take them down. Let's make it so a guy with a Colt knife doing two, three damage can finish him off, mm-hmm. right? Like, you can make up for it later. Um, and maybe that guy with a Colt knife now can score Robin Ransack, you know, in the late game. Because um, you always try to reveal that late. And oftentimes your agents are gone by that point. So Robin Ransack is fantastic if you've taken a guy down to two or three wounds. And then you just charge in 
just a regular GA2 guy or your icon bear just charges in with a 2-3 damage weapon and boom, like now you got Robin Ransack. But um, <clears throat> if you're doing stock target, the moment you shoot that model, like, I don't know, like it's hard to like leave them, leave them there because you just like, especially the guys coming at you, you just, oh, you want to, you want to get them like, you know, keep yourself safe. And then the number of times I've shot at to start like, I'm just going to wound this guy. I'll hit him with like a, a bolt pistol. And then you roll three crits and a hit. And then they, and then they're like happy to whiff their saves. They're like, oh, good. I denied your point. And that guy already did his job. And they're like, oh. like, you know, anyways, it's, uh, it's always risky. It's a little bit hard. Like it's easy to play around. Um, also on turn later, there's models they can start taking out of your deployment zone. So I don't, I guess I just had, honestly, I think I just had a couple of bad experiences where I killed the model that was supposed to stay alive or I left it alive intentionally and it just did so much destruction. And I was like, never again, kill everything. Everything dies. So, uh, yeah, it's, that's, uh, that's good insight. I think, well, I don't, I don't know if it is. Um, I just, it definitely I think is. if you really, well, I think if you play it really well, you can do very good with it, but it can be tricky. And I think I'm at the stage because I'm like, I don't stick with teams very long and I'm newer with the team. It's a harder one for me, but I think if you've been running worm blade, for a while, I think it's definitely one to really consider, but it's it, it's going to take a lot of nuance to really make sure you're not overexposing yourself by leaving a model alive, or you know, th- th- get that balance can be tricky. So I think the more experience you have, the better that one gets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like ultimately, I, I feel like the way to play it would be if your entire game plan is very patient and like you know someone's got uh, too many people on conceal, and then you, it's really easy to get the first one, like you said. And then the late game, like if if they whether they push or not, like if you super duper outnumber them, you can just wait till they're done and then and run up and get that second one. Um, but like that revolves around an entire game plan of like you know what your opponent's going to do. Um, and you're just super patient. Um, so yeah, not, mm-hmm. not necessarily the top choice, especially cause you have like infiltration has so many other good options. Um, it does yeah. specifically I, for worm blade. Exactly. But, um, that being said, what's so funny about this, there's very few tack ops that are just like bad. Um, the better, you know, that team and the more experience and comfort you have with it, the better that tack op becomes. Um, and then also the better, you know, your opponent. So the more you know, and certain factions play more straightforward. Like if you're going against Intercession and they have the Assault Grenadier, that dude's not staying in the back. He's coming up. Like, right? Like, and if you play that tack off, he, what's he going to do? Not come up? Like, oh, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm not going to give you a point by just not using my Grenadier. Like, yeah, good. Okay, I'll, I'll lose those two points. You throw away your Assault Grenadier, leave him in the back, win-win. Um, so there's certain teams where their gameplay is just can't change. It's too straightforward. Um, but yeah, I think the more, some of them are more niche, but that's good too. Like, is if you're playing a team, sometimes you get locked in early with like, oh, this is what works. And the more comfort and the more you know the team, you have to go back and reevaluate and see if you can make it fit again. So there's only one, there's only a couple tack ops that I, I just think are bad you should avoid. And one of them is an infiltration. Yeah, I, I think everyone um, knows. It's like the plant device install one. Device. Install device. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah unfortunately, yeah. having to do a thing in your opponent's side of the board and then defend it is not the key to a winning game plan, turns out. For like two turns. You need like, to have it completely it on- done and completely like uncontested by round two. Otherwise, you can't max it out. It's impossible. Oh my gosh, yeah. So you have to be in their deployment, do it on, like, say you, say you do it turn two, you install it turn two. You now have to defend it until the end of turning point three. For one point. Ugh. And it costs an action point. It's, like, action inefficient. Um, absolutely bizarre. Like, I don't know if that, like, I don't know how that one came about. I don't, like, that would be a fun one to see them go back and tweak. They have, like, GW hasn't looked at the, uh, the attack ops in a while, I feel like. I yeah, think we've been playing really- the 2022 world of crit ops for the last, you know, two years. So I yeah, think yeah. if everyone's suspicions that things are going to be changing up relatively soon are to be believed, then I would expect that TAC ops would be a thing that get a uh, heavy look or adjustment or maybe, you know, things kind of go away with how TAC ops are used. Because one of my big gripes design wise is that we've just moved away from using TAC ops as the balancing lever for the teams like Pathfinder is 
stuck on recon would be great if I could take Seek and Destroy, not allowed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and now the Wormblade new team actually, Wormblade are also another team where they are kind of, you know, they can't take security. If you could take security on a shooting team where you force your opponent oh. to come out early on, it would have been a really good deal. Maybe nowadays, you know, security is a little bit worse, but there was a period of time where it felt like teams were balanced somewhat around what they were allowed to take as secondaries. Blooded, another team, you know, if they could take infiltration or recon, I'm sure they would at least try it. Sure, the team definitely wants you to get in there, get stuck in, nuke all your dudes, but it's just a thing that they have to go do. Totally. Um, yeah, oh man, security I think would be fantastic. It, it, it all depends on the team and everything else, but I think Wormblade would love security. But now the new teams too that come out, they're like, well, which ones can they take? Well, whatever they want. Like also, let's just give them super good faction-specific tag ops. Like just like auto scores. Uh, so the new teams... It's funny, it's almost like the attack ops is almost what's unbalancing some of these new teams. Because like like Adrian was scoring six attack ops every game. Uh, Mandrake scored attack ops so well. I think there was a one game he dropped one attack op. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I do kind of yeah. expect that for teams like Mandrake's, the counterplay involves, you know, standing kind of in the open and taking shots in awkward positions and then responding in kind. But they do have enough tools where if you're not paying attention and you don't set it up properly, they will just kind of run away with the score because yeah, they're always going to be in and out of shadow if you let them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it would be nice to see some of the attack ops, attack ops get tweaked or readjusted as we go into the new edition. Um, Cause it could be such a strong way to balance the team. Yeah. And all this, of course, playing off install device is just the worst thing ever. Cre- like, I think yeah, you can all agree it's the worst tack off in the game. Yeah, yeah. enormous. I think awesome. everyone has to take a reread of it multiple times, you know. It's just like, oh, I, this seems really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Yeah, and you, yeah. you had mentioned um, you were you were chatting about what are some like key things to to train a player to be like a like really level up and be a top tier player and i think that like there's a piece of tac ops that really ties in with that as well where one of your biggest focuses in the game if you want to be like a top tier competitive player is you really need to know that your plan like in any game any board any matchup is going to get you six tac ops and then like five if your opponent really like messes you up but you should have a very clear path to six tac ops and that should be one of the biggest focuses if you're trying to be a competitive player um i agree with the small caveat it depends on the team like with Wormblade, i don't think i ever i rarely got six um and it was you, only because you need to bake in that tack ops exist, right? Like yeah, either oh, yeah, yeah. you you have to be able to either do yours or stop your opponent from scoring theirs. So one of the big things that comes up with seek and destroy players is that everyone thinks that eliminate guards is free. And if you are paying attention, you can play around eliminate guards by either going into your opponent's side or just not landing on your own objectives, which is something that I had to call out at Tacoma a couple times. Yeah, absolutely. But also, too, like some teams, like Wormblade Base, there's a couple teams that really play the primary mission strong. And so if you're going to rack up that primary, you just need to do a uh, stop loss on the tag. Like what you're saying, though, like you either need to get six or you need to find a way to do some mitigation. Um, you, like you should be playing for those tag. Like it's so crucial because every point matters. And in most teams that are somewhat balanced, the primaries end up being a wash by the end. Some like very frequently, like good, like if you're both top tail table players and the teams are somewhat close, like I'll take the early lead. You'll come back in the end and then the tack ops decide the game. Um, or like you're going to get like a one point lead or so if you're lucky. Wormblade's nice because you can take strong, aggressive primary leads. Um, and really kind of put yourself in the advantage that way. And then, but like once again, I, I lost that last game because. I got two tack ops. So if I had gotten three, that's it. Like that would have been, that's what, what I would have needed. Um, and so it was the tack ops that didn't cost me. Um, but it's just, I, I've never really needed six just because like I can get that aggressive point of point lead. But yeah, like the tack ops, nah, such a, such a deciding factor. 
But if you have a great tech op game and you can just keep the primaries like even and balanced, boom. I mean, yeah. if you've got a solid plan for six tech ops and your your aggressive early game lead, you're just gonna roll yeah. everybody. Well, then you win Tacoma Open. So, uh, no. but I did. You know, for so, anyone I, for anyone listening to the podcast, if you have if you haven't thought about this before and you are looking for ways to bake tech op play into your gameplay, hop on the Discord, ask us some questions. I'm sure that we've. I think all players who play at tournaments and do well in tournaments all kind of have our backup plans. And overall strategies for how we're going to score tech ops, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest factors to consider in all that is what your opponent can do to deny you. Like you were just talking about eliminate guard. Eliminate guard works great on lower and mid tables. It the higher up you get, the more it struggles because people know how to deny those models. Um, know how to not be on the points, not give you those options. Um, capture. It is going to be a little bit easier for eliminate guards because you you have to be on them. You have to uh, stay on those points um, or end on them. But yeah, the more play that your opponent has to work against you, the better players will do that. And also because that's the game. The game will be decided on the difference, like you were saying, with those tack ops. So the good players know how to get theirs and deny yours. And they're constantly working at all those little angles, all those small details. Um, so that's why recon can be good. Um, it's easier for some teams over Pathfinders, but recon can be good because oftentimes it can't be contested or it's very hard to deny. It's very hard to stop recover item now. It's, um, if you have models with ropes or fly or good movement, it's really hard to deny, um, secure advantage as long as there are advantages reasonably on the board um, or in, in the dark unexplored rooms um, so the more you maintain control that you're as long as your game plan follows a certain path and you get the points fantastic so yeah um, yeah I, I'll, I'll do another quick shout out for the tack ops that I like to play with intercession um, if like you bring four chain swords doom guy and a gunner and then you take route robin ransack and champion of humanity uh doom guy kills half oh. the enemy's entire team and that just happens in like 95 percent of games and then everyone else just like messes up the enemy and uh ha- makes them have a hard time keeping up on like primary because it's just like if i'm standing on your point you have to kill an intercessor and then like you either gotta like you don't want to fight him in melee um, cause you're going to be like trading up like nobody's business, but then he's not really there like a hundred percent trying to kill people. Um, cause he just wanted to steal your points and let doom guy clean up all the kills. And then, um, if one guy just needs to push through and like kill someone on round through round three, kill someone on round four. That's also Robin ransack. All of a sudden you've like maxed out your tech ops and it's super easy. So just like having an entire game plan around like the way you build your team, the way you play. And then something that's just unbelievably hard to not, to deny like the only way to prevent an intercessor intercessor player to get that is just to obliterate them like if you don't they just get yeah. it and there's nothing you can do about yeah. it yeah that is and everything you're describing there the synergy is yeah. so good so when you have these things that work so well together and it's like hey my guys are already running downfield to chop people up so why don't i take route because that's what they're doing they're going to be down there chopping mm-hmm. people up also, one of those guys that chops people up, you can just get Robin Ransack. He'll get Route and Rob. Boom. One chop gets both. Um, and you get to do situational based on his position, how survive is, is he behind a wall and outside of, uh, shooting of other people? And next turn, you get to flip him to conceal and hide him, to keep him alive. <clears throat> like the synergy is so strong. So the more you can do it all together, fantastic. Yeah. So. All right, we've gone through operative choice, finding the lines, attack ops, and a little and a lot of it about Wormblade actually over a couple different tournaments. But you are part of the SoCal community, and the SoCal SoCal community over the last couple of years has really kind of blossomed up as one of the other hotspots in the U.S. for Kill Team. I think there's the Pacific Northwest. We've got you guys down in SoCal. Obviously, the Northeast has been busy, and Florida and other parts of the Midwest have all been percolating over the last you know, three years of kill team edition. 
tell us a little bit about the region. You know, obviously there's a lot of different storylines with LVO being kind of the capstone piece for any given year in the region, because that's where all the energy goes. But what's been going on in SoCal? Uh, uh, I love the SoCal scene. It's really been blown up. It's really great. So first of all, I think our, un- it's undeniable, our leader is Dakota at uh, Squad Games. Um, so the squad has Giacomo, Dakota, Dakota's wife, Saya, amazing people, really helping together great tournaments. Um, just super nice, do an incredible job. Love their events, map packs, map packs, everything. Um, so they're up in LA and they kind of like, I think they've really been the core of what's making it grow and thrive. Um, the players are amazing. So we have a lot of guys that don't do a lot of traveling. Uh, me and my team, my kids, we like to get out. Uh, we went to Florida earlier this year, uh, where my son won a golden ticket at, um, uh, Battle Brother Ben's tournament, the Magnolia Open. So we got to see the Florida. I know we're not so much on the Florida scene, but they're really cool guys. Awesome. But I've been able to see a lot of the other communities over the time, see them grow and all that. But San Diego, a lot of the people are just stay local. You know, it's hard to get out and travel. You just kind of play in your local group. So a lot of people don't get to see there's there's a lot of talent here. There's a lot of strong players. And it's been really nice. I think we'll all we all just make each other better as we keep playing. Um I mentioned Alexander Popov. He's uh just a, a like now should I be talking about their uh, playing ability or like because like some of these guys are just really cool no, people. Just tell us a little bit about hype up your region. You know, we love over region? here on our podcast to talk about our different little communities and why we're still in the game. You know, three years in, it's just as much about the player base and the player skill, but it's also about the communities that we've all been growing over the long period of time. You know, me and Jason are kind of community leaders in our own little subsections. And that's why we have the podcast so that we can talk about not just the competitive stuff, but the people that make it fun. Yeah, no, I love it. So yeah. um, Yeah. I love, I love the area here. Um, There's so many guys I want to talk about, but yeah, it's um, like, for example, our local uh, Rob McLeod, or he goes by Highlander Rob on discord. Uh, He's a teacher. Uh, super cool guy. He's the one who did the mirror match into Adrian. So like, there's not many. I don't think there's many areas where just like, oh, the average guy's part of here is going to take on and beat Adrian in a mirror match. Like, you have to play Adrian to know how good he is and know how like he just sees every line and every angle. And I felt so proud that like one of the local players here was able to step up and do that. Um, man, and it's so cool too. We got just some guys that like kind of you know every community. There's like those guys that follow those those niches. So we have a guy, James Robinson. He's super into chaos and nerval. So he was a Geller Fox player for a long time. We brought him back for this last turn we did um, to play Team America and beat uh, Team USA with his Geller Fox. Um, at one of the last events, he ran all Neagle, uh, Nurgle uh, chaos teams. So just all plague bearers. The whole tournament, he was just like all plagues all the time. And uh, such a tough team to deal with. Um, yeah, man, we got my my group. San Diego is uh, mostly purple. We're the Kel, my Kel team. Uh, so it's my kids, my friends. Um, we just got Jason Steinkey, the guy who won SoCal Open, to join us. Um, but yeah, so we have get-togethers between LA, San Diego, Orange County. And we all tended to, like, the whole SoCal region will travel a little bit just to have our, our tournaments get togethers. If you want to see the community or get togethers or stuff like that, um, we're on Discord. You can see what you know, see what we're doing. Um we try to be as welcoming as possible. We want new people to come in. Um we do have on a regular basis new people jumping in. We had a couple of new people at that big the Team USA thing. We had some new people jumping in, getting their first games in. It's always great to see. I always love to see people learning because you never know. Some might have their first tournament now, and a couple tournaments later, they're taking the whole thing down. We just don't know who's going to just climb and be the next killer in the in the group. But um, yeah, um, the SoCal region is not for the faint of heart. Though there are some there are some monsters in the water out here for sure. So, but if you want to uh, get better and really get some challenges, definitely a great group to help teach you, bring you in, and really push you to that next level to really do well. 
Yeah. Obviously, Dakota was our first sponsor way back out when we first started doing the podcast. So we're always super appreciative to call him out and bring attention to the work that he does in the SoCal region. Obviously, you guys are doing this big team tournament for the WTC, but there's also the All Valley team tournament later this year, right? Yeah. Oh, we got to talk about that. <laughs> so that one's up in Santa Clarita. Um, it's not, it's a tournament. If you can make it, you got to make it. You showed up, um, you, worked, you didn't last, get a plane. I've been, yeah, I've been yeah. around the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it sucks though. You'll, you've been here and like, you've been able to stop by. It's so funny when Travis shows up, it's like a celebrity tour. Like he shows up like, Oh my God, Travis is here. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, but we want you to be like, we want you to join. Maybe bring Adrian and Jason out. The three of you do that'd be a team. So maybe you guys can, uh, but I, I just, it's tough. The East coast is a big trip. It's a big thing. And it's not like, it's more for fun. It's, yeah. And that's the, the September 21st weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take your word for it. I believe that's it. We already showed, I don't know dates. So <clears throat> I'm not great at that. Pull but, um, right here. Yep. We're we'll in the show notes for everyone who's interested in going. So we won't, they won't, it won't be missed. Absolutely. This year, the entire winning team gets uh, three golden tickets. So three goldens at AVTT. So it might be a little sweatier than it was the last couple of years. The last couple of years was a lot of fun. Um, playing in the team format is why I'm so excited about WTC. Because when you play, like everyone has those games. You go into the best of intentions. An initial role goes against you. Certain things happen. You lose by one. And man, it can be a bummer. And then you turn around and your teammate won, you're hyped for them. And then the last game's going, the both of you are watching them just so like on the edge of your seat, like, man, is this guy going to pull it off by a point or two? Um, there's so much excitement when you play with a team. AVTT is just so much fun. And uh, Dakota has it built out to be the biggest event we've had so far. Um, just like it really emphasizes that communal aspect, the community, like, and then with AVTT, we are having teams come from different regions. Um, we always, I think we almost always have like at least one East Coast team come out. We're having, I think, a team or two from the Pacific Northwest. We got the Bay Area guys coming down. I was trying to hype those Florida guys out, like those Gator lovers. I'm trying to get them, like, you know, get them out to the West Coast for it. Um, last time we had uh, Six Sided Legion came and joined us. So Midwest guys. Yep, I don't know Wisconsin. where exactly. Everyone in the Midwest is the same to me. It's all Kansas. Yep. <laughs> so. Nah, anyways, but yeah, it's so much fun. But this time with the golden tickets, it's going to be, there's going to be some uh, intensity people are bringing. So I'm looking forward to it. I think AVDT is always one of the most fun events of the year. So if you're on the yeah. fence, you should definitely f go get your friends. If you don't have friends, go make friends. So go or find frenemies you can fight with. Maybe... Maybe take someone you don't like, then you don't have to face them. Yeah, there you go. About that. Go find some guy in your community that's just like always your nemesis that you've been fighting with and be like, let's join forces. You and I and get some third join guy. Join forces to take Whoa. down SoCal's best at the All oh, Valley yeah. Team Tournament, September 21st, 22nd, and yep. snag three golden tickets and represent the U.S. on the World Championship stage. Oh, absolutely. Come take on the Kimmy Jelly. And then, some, uh, you know, one month later, come to the New York Open and snag one of the more competitive tickets and then go to the World Championships with you and four of your friends and have a great time. Oh, I just yeah. wanted to give the out York one tiny call out there. Oh, absolutely. I'm bummed. I think the only big event I have been to is the New York Open. It's always worked out to be like a bad weekend. I really want to make it out to that. Um, and also, now, now I've seen... You run some of the best events. Uh, okay. Dakota might be listening to this. So, I mean, Dakota runs the best. I'm friends <laughs> with Dakota. I can't. Okay. But Travis, you really killed it at Tacoma, man. So, um, and I know like, man, New York's your scene. I'd love to get out there and be part of the New York Open. I'm hoping I can make it happen soon. So, hopefully this year. We'll see what happens. Yep. For any listeners that don't already know, um, the New York Open is October 26th weekend. End of October. So, that's like the Halloween weekend. Yeah, I, I think last year it was. I don't know if it is this year, but last year I think was the last golden ticket given out. 
right? It was, yeah, because we were the month of November and it was the beginning of November. So I think it was us and then there's nothing else and then the World Championship happened. This year we moved it up a week because that way, in case anyone from New York wins it, they can rearrange their busy schedules to kind of get a chance to go. Last year we had to let Canyon Roller Crit go as third place, which was totally fun. He got second yeah. place as advice and ran Hearth and Salvagers. That was a great little, great little meme for the upper, for the competitive groups. But this year, we're moving it around, trying to get some stuff out of the way because we've been on the same weekend as the New York City Marathon <laughs> multiple times. So we're, we moved it up to try to avoid the marathon. And Jason might even show up. So if you want to meet the Just Planning Let Kill Team it, cast, yeah. we should be there. Well, if, if I find a way to make it, you better be there, Jason. Let's go. I oh, mean, yeah. we got to make it. So yep. I've got it on yeah, my calendar, what? planning to be there. Okay, awesome. I remember last year in the discussion... Um, the U.S. players for going to Worlds, we all had a big group chat and like planning out how to like, uh, we got like American flags, we had different things to like, you know, kind of be a big unified team. And we all of us were just waiting to see who's going to get Travis's ticket at New York Open. And it was like that last minute. And it was, it was exciting to like, wait as that ticket came in. But so if this year goes by and you know what, you, you know, you're saying to yourself, I deserve to be in Atlanta. I'm one of the best. And somehow GW didn't give me my ticket yet. That's your way. There you go. So that is, go to, that is why it's there. Yeah. Go to New York and you got to prove it. You got to show up and say, look, I'm one of the best. So, but yeah, great yeah. end of year for Florida man. Yeah. Jimmy, thank you for coming on and talking pretty much up and down all the topics that we love to talk about on just another kill team podcast communities, bringing everyone close together. And of course, in-depth reviews of a single team, the Wormblade, the second Gene Sailor cult team that people are complaining about. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me guys. It's always great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for everything for you do on. for the community and everything. Happy to be here.